Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here um, joined on time. Uh, I assume we have uh, some other participants that will join us later once they um, get their devices ready and online. Uh, so uh, we can expect more people to join us. Um, however, uh, we will be very um, uh, precise on time and timing and we'll be respectful of everybody's uh, attendance and um, taking the time to participate in this uh, online bootcamp. So I'm very excited to um, open this first online bootcamp, uh, the first I'm holding uh, and I know, I think I know that it's the first that we hold uh, in Israel for the CISSP. Um, however, there are many, many uh, options out there, uh, many groups that I encourage all of you, if you pursue your uh, CISSP uh, certificate, um, to go online and look for these groups. There are many groups and we will speak about them uh, as we go uh, through the bootcamp. Um, just uh, a little side note, uh, side note on this uh, bootcamp, we have participants from basically all over the world, um, over 90 participants in this online bootcamp, only uh, over 90 uh, registers uh, for this online bootcamp. I believe that we will get to a fairly large number of participants as well. Uh, and basically people from all over the world, most of them are Israelis, however, not only Israelis here. That's why this bootcamp is being held in uh, English. We have people from Canada, the US, Europe, China, um, Ethiopia, Angola, uh, and obviously Israel. Um, most of the crowd is Israeli. Um, so. Just to cover all bases, I'll say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of us. Um, <clears throat> we have scheduled. Make sure that you're um, you have muted um, your mic, uh, and if you didn't, I'll do it for you. <laughs> as we go. So we have scheduled 10 sessions for this bootcamp, for the CISSP bootcamp. I hope and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it will be sufficient. However, uh, I'm open to adding more sessions if we need to, if we see that we need uh, to cover um, um, more thoroughly uh, some of the topics, some of the areas uh, more, more than uh, I'll be more than happy to, to do that for for everyone in the group. Um, so uh, any one of you can reach out to me directly uh, via email or WhatsApp or I am on Facebook. I'm trying to reply. I'm doing my best to reply as soon as possible to all. Uh, but those of you who know me know that I treat WhatsApp and I am messages in general just like emails. So I'm, I'm kind of you know, trying to get back to everyone in time, but it will take time. So uh, I'm just you know, uh, raising the concerns on my side and please don't be offended if it takes some time to reply. Um, <clears throat> you can use the uh, MS Teams app on your phone or on your computer. You don't have to have the license for the uh, Microsoft Teams to participate in this bootcamp. This is a, an open invitation for everyone uh, outside SciTech, so it should be open and usable for everyone without uh, having the license for Microsoft 365. So that area should be covered for all of you to participate. The sessions are recorded, as you can see or not, but the sessions are recorded and we will be available for everyone online um, to download and uh, uh, future use. Uh, maybe you want to listen to that uh, when you're in the car. Some of you asked for recorded sessions that they can download um, to their phones. I assume again, kind of audiobooks or or audio bootcamp, uh, if you may. 
And um, please feel free to ask any questions during the bootcamp using the chat, and I will again do my best to uh, either answer them online as we go, if it'll be something that is relevant for everyone in the group, or I will probably answer after the session is ended, try to reply to all questions. Um, feel free to reach out to me on any topic via email, and you should, you all of you should have my email uh, since you got my invitation with the details of this bootcamp. And um, I'm looking forward to um, having this uh, uh, sessions with you. And um, I know it's it's a bit different from having class sessions. So those of you that actually sit uh, in one of my classes know that by heart I'm uh, I'm kind of a, a, a trainer or 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 a lecturer that likes to uh, have the crowd or, or the listeners participate in the session. So it's very interactive. So this is the first time for me doing this e-learning and it feels kind of a remote, but those of you again that know me uh, can probably uh, imagine the, the, the expressions on my face and the movement with my hands and all these things that I do in class to uh, actually make people involved. So let's imagine that we're all in the class and you're not very silent and we're, we're all participating in this. Uh, even though I'm I'm going to do most of the speaking or all of the speaking now, um, but again, feel free to to ask questions via chat, and if it's uh, super important and and super critical, we will do. Uh, I will do my best to uh, maybe uh, share with everyone uh, in the group. Um, let's begin. Um, it's uh, six minute, uh, minutes after five, and uh, again, we will do our best to start on time and. Uh, finish on time. So let's be respectful of everybody's time here. Um, and let's begin with this bootcamp. So uh, I hope you can all see my screen um, here. Um, but what, what we're going to do now is that we're going to go over some basic rules for the CISSP as you plan your way toward the exam and therefore the certification, holding the certification. So the first thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing this, when you're taking this bootcamp or any bootcamp or any any effort that that you uh, uh, put in in the uh, preparing yourself for the CISSP is to pass the exam. That's your main objective. You want this stamp, you want this certificate on your resume for various reasons. Uh, basically, it's standardization of today's security world for executives. So you cannot. Uh, apply for a job today in the States without having either CISSP or CISM. For those of you that uh, have difficult times pronouncing it right and call it CISP, bear in mind that in my years it's it's painful to hear the word CISP uh, and, and not the, 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 the right one, which is CISSP. I worked very hard on this, you worked very hard on this, so, you know, Let's make it valuable. <laughs> uh, let's make it a CISSP for all. Um, the tips, the top tips uh, I have for you um, uh, in, the, in the next few slides are uh, will will kind of guide you through the exam. So the exam is the money time, is is the game that we are about to to play with ISC. We're going to their court, okay? So it's it's kind of a uh, outside game. We're, we're guests in their court. It's not our home court. We're playing in their area. So it's their rules. It's their state of mind. And we need to beat them. We need to win. And those of you that uh, actually went through some sports and went through uh, guests uh, uh, um, uh, games know how difficult it is. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to be a good sport uh, a sports team, but it's another to win to actually win in in a foreign uh, court. So this is what we're going to work on. Um, it, it, mainly, we're going to work on this during the bootcamp. Know how to win in the game of ISC. ISC's goal is to make money. Okay, it's it's really important to remember that, and they make money from us paying membership and from us paying for their exams. Every CISSP exam will cost you $700. Even if you take it for the eighth time, unfortunately, if you, if you failed seven times and you take it for the eighth time, 
this will still cost you seven hundred dollars my goal personally on this boot camp is to make you pay only once so to support you and to make you take the exam once and to pass it in first attempt i personally failed my first attempt and um it was back many years ago and then um, you know i learned from this failure i fell by uh just one one question uh my score was 697 instead of 700 and uh this taught me a lot uh, on how to pass and how to deal with ic um eventually i passed my cissp exam and here i am now trying to help you pass yours so when you look at the cissp exam cissp principles uh it's important to remember for all questions human safety is number one uh when 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 you have a, an answer in your four answers this is a multiple uh, um, uh choice uh, uh type of questionnaire of uh isc one of the answers is concern uh, concerns uh, uh human safety that is probably your right answer so you want to direct your mind to that area of course they might want to confuse you and just put human safety there for a reason uh, just to get you confused because they want you to fail they want to win their game um, so you keep that in mind that human safety comes first but you still need to read the question and the answers Ethical behavior, we will speak a lot about ethical behavior during this bootcamp because it's really important to keep that in mind. We don't want to uh, 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 break the law. We, want, we don't want to uh, um, uh, do things uh, uh, that are not ethical. ISC puts uh, uh, a lot of effort in, in reminding us that, you know, it's one thing to be a security professional, but it's another thing to keep ethics in place. And this comes first. Uh, this comes before being a security professional. Later on, the, the uh, third one uh, and the fourth one kind of goes together. Maximize profits and minimize losses. This is type, the, the, the uh, business type of thinking. So you want to have that in mind uh, when you do everything uh, that you do uh, in your CISSP. And when you think like a security professional, you think about uh, maximizing profits and minimizing losses. Last but not least, um, you need to also consider that all controls that you have, every control, whether it's encryption, whether it's access control, whether it's a fence here and there, or a security guard, or even a policy, every control must be justified. A control with no justification becomes a risk by itself because it wastes money, and it can create vulnerabilities of its own and we don't want to do that so every control must be justified next you will need to score 700 in your exam and as you can see here we are facing an adaptive computer based exam which means that uh, the computer kind of learns us uh, and our questionnaire our exam can vary uh, from 100 questions all the way to 150 questions. We will still have the same three hours to score 700 on those questionnaires, whether it's 100 or up to 150 questions. And I will speak about that soon. So why do we get 100 or 100 and more questions? How does this work? So the CAD exam uh, of ISC is based on an AI type of machine that we need to beat. That's the opponent. That's the, uh, the, the, the team on the other side. ISC's team on the other side is the computer. And that computer, when once you register for the CISSP exam, um, puts aside 100 questions for you from all eight domains. So that'll give you 12, 13 questions per domain. And this questionnaire will be ready for you as you register. So if you register for uh, uh, today and your exam is in two months, you already have the, that questionnaire. Um, those questions are ranked from level one, which is the lowest, all the way up to level five, which is the hardest. You will always need to, in any CISSP exam, you will need to answer questions all the way up to rank five, to level five. 
just the question for you is what is your start point? So everyone's start point is level three and everyone's start point is 100 questions. But let's say that you got your, your uh, uh, first level three on domain one, which is today's domain, risk management. You got that one wrong. So what happens next is that the questionnaire now adds questions from level two of that domain because they want to make sure that you can pass the exam. So they ask you kind of a lower level type of questions now, but your questionnaires, your questionnaire now becomes longer. So it's not 100 questions, it can be 104, 108, maybe 120. If you get all domains wrong in domain in level three, then your questionnaire is now about 130 questions. If you get level two wrong, then level one is now added, and those are the, the easy questions, right? What is the risk formula? R equals uh, risk equals impact times probability. We'll speak about that in domain one. Uh, but now you have all these easy questions, yet your questionnaire is now longer. The longest that it can be is 150 questions. And I had students that passed on 102 questions, and I had student that, students that passed on 150th question. Uh, our target together is to bring you to the level of knowledge and experience that will get you to pass as close as possible to the 100 questions of the questionnaire. So the more questions you get right, the harder your questionnaire, the, the harder the exam gets. But the harder the exam gets, the more the closer you are to passing it and vice versa. So if you get those questions wrong and the questions becomes e become easy for you, the, the, the further away you are from passing the CISSP exam. And remember, this is our goal in this bootcamp. We want to pass the exam. So my recommendation is to take your first 10 to 15 questions. Take the time, take your time, take about two, three minutes per question on your first 10 or 15 questions. Yes, it sounds like it's wasting a lot of time at the beginning, but it will score all level three questions and eliminate level two and level one questions from your questionnaire. That way you will have the questionnaire closer to 100 questions and not adding the level two and level three. Um, so get those first questions right and bear in mind that there's no going back because this is a CAD exam. The computer actually learns you and learns your way and understands what difficult, what is difficult for you. Then it'll make sure that the next question will be either more difficult or just adding some more questions, some easier questions to make it difficult for you in time. So it's either difficult in professionalism in understanding the questions and answering them right or difficult in time. Either way, they want to make life difficult for us. So bear in mind that when you answer a question, there's no going back. Uh, so get those questions right. You will have questions, uh, as I said, you, you will have the, the obvious questions of a question and four uh, choices, but you also, always, uh, uh, you also have uh, scenario-based questions. So scenario-based questions is uh, has different objectives. The main objective of scenario based questions is to waste your time. OK, bear in, bear in mind that, you know, long questions are there to waste your time. They will confuse you with information with all different domains and all different areas of the CISSP. Some of it will not even relate to the CISSP. Some of it is something that you know from just being in the industry. So um, have your tactics ready for the scenario based questions and know that once you have a long question, the answer might be very easy. So you need to look at the question or identify the question and what is relevant for the question. Here on this area for the scenario based questions, my tip is to practice, practice and never stop practicing. So you need to practice your English. Most of us is, uh, do not have the English as, as mother tongue. Um, and we need to practice the English and understand not just the English as a language, but the English of ISC Square. Again, ISC Square is the opponent. We, we, we're there to beat them. 
Next, you will have the hotspot example, uh, the hotspot questions. So for this one, for example, the question is click on the message digest. And we will get to that in domain three when we will talk about encryption and hash and hashing or hash algorithms. Uh, here, obviously, the answer is number three. This is the message digest. What you see here is the ciphertext. What you see here, uh, number one is the plain text. For number five is the ciphertext. And in the middle, after uh, getting the plain text through the hash function or hash algorithm, we get the message digest. Another example for questions is drag and drop. Um, here they give us uh, many possible answers and they say, okay, choose all correct answer. For this one is the, what is this securely uh, uh, erased for uh, an SSD drive? So the SSD drive is not HDD drive and we will speak about that in domain two. Um, and they, they, wanna, they wanna make sure that we know uh, how to, differentiate the HDD, the old school drives from today's drives. So we cannot use the Gausser, for example, or the Gaussing for SSD. We can only use the ATA secure race or physical destruction to destroy all data. And look at, look at the question and look at what they're really asking us here. They're asking which method will securely and reliably destroy all data. So they don't mind us destroying the data. Okay, it's not, it's not something that we need to be concerned of. We just need to make sure that it will not be available anymore. And this gives us the option of the physical destruction of the media. So these are the drag and drop uh, uh, questions. Um, your CISSP is built from eight domains and these are the eight. Uh, we will go over them uh, uh, one by one. And today we will start with the uh, security and risk management domain one. The most important thing to remember about the CISSP is that all domains are important, but some of them are more important than others. Um, and, and those that are important, more important than others is one, domain one, domain three, and domain five. Since domain five is uh, 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 identity and access management, um, this is probably over 90% of the controls that we we expected to see in CISSP and in security in general, because once a user or an or, or a subject gets access to an object, uh, then it's game over, right? Uh, they can download it, they can manipulate it, they can change the 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 uh, the behavior of that object, and we will speak about that a lot. Domain number three is the domain about security engineering, and it's the domain that a lot of people are kind of uh, intimidated by since it includes a lot of encryption. It sounds difficult, but hopefully with uh, the help of you all and this group, this uh, uh, great uh, large group of people, uh, we will make it easy for all of us to remember what needs to be remembered and understand what needs to be understood before the uh, before we take the CISSP exam, before we get up to the the the, uh, the the field and beat ISC, the most important domain of all is domain number one. So let me give you a tip: if you are not um, uh, uh, fully in full understanding and in full control and getting the grades up more than eighty-five percent in your practice exams on domain one, do not register for the exam yet. Take your time, master domain one, and then and only then register for the CISSP exam. Domain one is risk management. Domain one is the way businesses work. And if you remember, we talked about us being thinking like businessmen. And this is what ISC wants us to, to think, because a lot of people come from a different technical knowledge and background, However, not too many technical people can connect the dots uh, uh, along the way to make a business case in front of uh, senior management. So uh, the uh, risk management is the way we balance everything. And we will speak about that a lot. So domain one uh, above all other seven domains is the most important one. Without that domain, without controlling that domain, 
I highly recommend not to register for your exam yet. I hope uh, this is this is makes life uh, easier and more clear along the way uh, in our path to to achieve the CISSP certification. Um, and again, if you have any questions so far, uh, please feel free to uh, IM me uh, on the uh, private uh, message or the chat room uh, on Teams. So for this one, for this uh, uh, bootcamp, we will follow um this book here let me just bring it up for you um let me just do this let's stop sharing and then i'll share my uh, browser bear with me for a second Okay, I hope you can all see my screen now. This is the book that we follow uh, during this bootcamp. This is the IC Square official um, study guide, and this is the eighth edition. And you have the link to purchase this book, whether uh, as a Kindle book or a printed book. You can purchase that online in Amazon. It should cost you about thirty something dollars uh, plus shipment to wherever you are. Um, about uh, 200 checkouts for those of you that are from Israel uh, per book. But this book uh, is the study guide, is the book that you will be tested on. So um, it can be uh, downloaded again as a Kindle book, but uh, this, this is the book that we're going to follow. It has 21 chapters and in each, uh, uh, um, in each session we will try to cover as much as possible from it. The first sessions will be very slow because it's again, it's domain one, but then again, uh, later on sessions uh, uh, will be much quicker than today's session. But this this is your book. This is what you need to uh, purchase in order to get your uh, CSSP uh, exam ready. So let's go back to our presentation and let's start with chapter one on your book, Security Governance Through Principles and Policies. So when we say security go governance, what we really say is the, we, we uh, describe the book of law, quote unquote, of the organization. So the book of law includes all uh, practices of how to support the business, uh, whether it comes from the outside or the inside of the organization. When I say the outside of organization, I refer to laws, regulations, and standards, security standards. For example, the law uh, that we can refer to can be HIPAA, uh, privacy in medical record. Regulations can be GLBA for privacy in uh, uh, financial institutes in the US. And the industry standard can be ISO 27001 or PCI DSS for credit cards. All these three layers will come from the outside, while these two layers, the business strategy and organizational policies, will be written inside the organization. So those are the external requirements versus the internal requirements. One thing that we need to consider is when we do correct governance or the right way of governance, those internal requirements that we set, we, when I say we, is the organization, but we set, uh, cannot uh, uh, overrule anything that comes from the outside. So, for example, I cannot write a policy that says if I'm, if I'm a medical organization that handles a lot of PHI, protected health information, um, I cannot write a policy that says uh, uh, the PHI, the PHI that we collect from individuals, from patients in hospitals, will be published online in a, in a free database for everyone to use. Because this violates the Privacy Act, which we call HIPAA, the, uh, uh, the, the privacy law that is aimed to protect the privacy of the individuals when we use their uh, medical records. So uh, the external requirements are much stronger than anything that comes from the inside of the organization. 
So I can think of a question, and you, you guys can think of questions as well of, of uh, the CISSP and ISC and the way they want to make us fail this exam, um, of, of them describing the situation of, of an organization that would like to put together a policy which is great, acceptable by everyone in the organization. We get all the votes from senior management, yet this policy has certain area that is a bit problematic with some remote law that was mentioned in the book. So you will need to remember that mention of the law and what it says and where can be a conflict in your question between the internal requirements and the external requirements. The CIA triad, as we all know it, uh, refers to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information. Uh, it's really important to emphasize this. We're dealing with information. We're not dealing with anything that is not related to the information. We, we, we treat people, process, and technologies that handle information. Um, if a technology is a, a, a gate, an electronic gate that opens and closes uh, um, before uh, uh, entering the data center, then that is the protection of the information inside the data center. If it's just a door somewhere in the building that doesn't lead to anywhere with uh, uh, or information which can be very remote uh, uh, possibility, uh, you know, that door will probably won't interest us as, as much unless it's a physical control in the uh, toward some uh, information or some sensitive information behind it. Also, for the relation of the object and the subject subjects, as I mentioned before, subjects are users or organizational entities can be also systems, machines can also be subjects, anything that touches the object. The object is passive, the subject is active. Um, so if you get a question and you need to identify the subjects and objects, and you need to identify the connection uh, between the two, and this will be more relevant in uh, uh, domain five when we talk uh, uh, about the uh, uh, access management uh, and the relations between subjects and objects, um, then you will need to consider how well you connect the two without uh, disclosing uh, extra uh, information beyond of what that object of, of what that subject sorry uh, needs to uh, be familiar with. And those of you that that have those controls in mind will probably already uh, connected the dots uh, between the uh, need to know, list privileges, separation of duties, and and so on and so forth. So the CIA triad. Um, has a, a, a some sort of a trick behind it. Um, it must be balanced. So uh, anything that we do on confidentiality cannot uh, overrule things that we will do in integrity or cannot uh, uh, take away some of the integrity or uh, anything we do in integrity cannot take away some of what we do in availability. So this triad must be balanced. Uh, and it's important to remember that as you answer your questions, you cannot invest a lot of in, a lot of uh, uh, money or resources or controls on confidentiality on the expense of either integrity or availability. Now, the way to remember the CIA triad, and I know it's easy to remember CIA confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, relatively easy to remember. But the way to remember that in your questions is to remember what is not part of the CIA or the uh, uh, opposite of the CIA. So for confidentiality, I can expect questions to be something like, how can I uh, avoid from disclosing some of the sensitive information of the organization? This question really asks us about the confidentiality of the information, but the word confidentiality is not in the question. So the word disclosure of information is in the question, and we need to remember that the opposite of disclosure is confidentiality. So when they ask me about a problem 
that is disclosure of information, the controls that I need to have in mind are for confidentiality, okay? The same thing happens with integrity. When they ask me about data alteration or information alteration, which is uh, unauthorized uh, change in information or uh, uh, not monitoring changes of information, uh, then we want to invest in integrity controls, okay? And the same thing for data destruction. The data is not available for the user or the data or the system uh, cannot respond to a user. Maybe it's a DDoS attack. Maybe it's something else that stops the system from responding, but the system is not available. So we say the destruction of data or destruction of connectivity is the opposite of availability. So those controls that we look for will be for availability of information. That can be system redundancy, business continuity plan, disaster recovery, anything that is related to availability, backups and such. So if you put those together and you look at them, uh, combine one uh, um, uh, against the other, is the CIA on one hand and then DAD, DAD, on the other hand. So DAD is the opposite of CIA. Questions with DAD, with disclosure, alteration, and destruction of data, will require uh, uh, controls of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is the way to address those CISSP questions, and there can be questions in this area, and I know it looks kind of easy for most of us, but there can be questions in level five for the CIA versus that. Um, they just make them very, very annoying questions uh, along the way. The next topic is IAAA. IAAA is on our way to get access uh, anywhere in the organization. We go through the IAAA. IAAA means identification, authentication, authorization, and auditing. And the result of all this four is accountability. And accountability is important because we want someone to blame, quote unquote. We want someone to take responsibility. And not just any responsibility, we want that one person that we can pinpoint and say, you are accountable for this system, for this data. And it's really important because as we do audits, as we do uh, due diligence and due care, and we will speak about that soon, uh, we want to have someone that is fully accountable for everything that happens in that area. So that, the, the accountable person, and it's always a person, it's never an organization. You cannot just say, oh, SciTech is accountable for something, or my organization is, is, the organization cannot be accountable for anything. The people can be accountable for everything. Okay, so bear that in mind as you deal with those questions. So let's talk about identification. The identification, the I, the first I, is the identification or claiming an identity by a subject. Um, and this should connect the dots for us so far. Claiming an identity is something anyone can do. Okay, so this is outside of our control. Anyone can come in and say, hey, I'm Chen, I'm from Cytec, or hey, I'm the CEO. And we see that today with uh, a lot of attacks, phishing attacks and, and, and spear phishing attacks and, and CEO fraud and whatnot out there. Anybody can come in and claim an identity. The only thing that we can do to either, I wouldn't call it prevent, but minimize the possibility for identity theft is to minimize the amount of information or private information that those executives or those sensitive identities have out there. So, uh, for example, we will work with our users on raising their awareness on security to say, look, uh, be careful on what it is that you put on your Facebook page. Um, you know, if, if you're an executive in the organization, Pay attention to what you put out there. Don't just put anything out there because other people can target your identity and anyone can claim your identity. The closer they are to the real identity, the more uh, uh, 
open window they have for our mistakes, for people on our side to make mistakes and let them in. So identification can be claimed by anyone. The other side of it is the triple A, is the things that we can do in our organization. Uh, and what we can do in our organization is to make sure that we get the authentication right. We get the boundaries or uh, restrictions along the way uh, before uh, um, before we let people in. Um, so authentication is really looking at the identity and saying, OK, I realize that you're saying that you're the CEO, but what makes you the right identity for the CEO? And this is the part that we can challenge that identification side. Uh, the most common one is using the password. Uh, so we ask them, what's the password? And if they say one, two, three, four, OK, that's the right password. You can go in. But that's a weak one. That's a weak authentication mechanism. We want to strengthen that mechanism for authentication. And by strengthening the mechanism for authentication, um, we make the life of identity thieves much harder to pass that, that line in, 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 on the way into our organization. The types of authentication mechanisms that we use are those main three, the first three, something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. We categorize, we kind of quote unquote in the CISSP categorize them as type one, type two, and type three. The something that you know, obviously passwords or passphrases, something that you have can be a token, can be a token on my phone, can be some smart card, can be a badge, can be, I don't know, a, a pink t-shirt, something that we all know that we need to have in order for us to pass the test of authentication on something that we have. Something that you are, type three, can be anything that is biometric, can be a fingerprint, can be retina scan, iris scan, palm scans, voice, hand geometry, or even behavior. Okay, this is really important to remember. Behavioral actions or, or, or uh, uh, behavior of a user can be categorized as something that you are. And something that you are can be um, movement with your hand or signature or anything that you do, um, again, in, along the way to test your identity, uh, the, the identity that you claim to authenticate you along the way toward your access. Somewhere that you are is another type of authentication mechanism, and we see that a lot today. We see that uh, with the uh, um, uh, geolocation, GPS location, using our smartphones or using wearables, uh, but that is not part of the three types of authentication. We have three categories that we will need to remember. So ISC Square will ask us in the CISSP exam, what is type two uh, mechanism for authentication? What can be a good example for type two? Type two, you will need to remember that type two is something that you have. Okay, and something that you have from those four answers that they give you is probably a token or a smart card. But how do you remember the sequence of something that you know, have, and are? So I put together the ka picture here for you. Um, so remember the word ka. Ka is the snake from Jungle Book. And if you haven't watched that movie yet, please do. It's kind of a childhood thing that you have to go through. Um, so the snake in Jungle Book is called ka with double A. So I just added the H instead of the middle A. And now you have something that you know, have, are. No, type one, have, type two, are, type three. That's how you remember it. And believe me, there are going to be questions on this, exactly this. What is type three? And you will need to remember something that you are, okay? Um, and uh, in questions, in complex questions or scenario-based questions, I can expect them to ask you to build a mechanism for two-factor authentication or maybe even multi-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication will be two of the three combined. So you need something that you know, a password, and also a fingerprint. 
So this is a, a two-factor authentication. But if I need you to be somewhere, okay, uh, I need you to be in a geolocation and then run your fingerprint and type your password, then this one is now multi-factor authentication, okay? Because it's more than just two factors. Uh, having your token and smart card is one factor authentication. It's not a strong authentication. Strong authentication means that you use more than one factor uh, for the authentication. Let's go to the third, uh, the uh, second A, which is authorization. After we claim the identity, after we pass the tests for authentication, now we go through a test, quote unquote, for authorization. So this is the areas, once you're in the organizations, these are the areas that you can actually touch, that the doors that you can actually open and the files that you can actually go to and change or, or not change or just read them. Uh, so for the authorization, we will need to uh, go through at least these two principles. What do you need to know in order for you to do your job? And what do you need access to in order for you to do your job? So if you may, the need to know is the question about what type of data you need to know for you to do your job. And the least privileges is what type of system you need to touch in order for you to do your job. So what do I need to know of the information to do my job, the data to do my job, and what do I need access to the data on a system to do my job, okay? So remember this as the data need to know and system list privileges. The auditing sums up everything that we can do in our organization toward the, the uh, achieving the accountability. So auditing means that, yeah, we have all the controls in place for uh, authentication, multi-factor authentication, and we made sure that this individual works here and is actually that individual we want to have inside. And that individual is following the need to know and list privileges and all their access is controlled and everything is right. However, mistakes happen and we want to make sure that we know of those mistakes, okay? So this is really important. We need to know when prevention failed. The most important thing after prevention failed is to detect the failure. And this is what auditing is about. We need to audit to detect um, any failure in authentication and in authorization. Um, and then when we do the auditing right, we can also uh, get the principle of non-repudiation. Someone cannot deny, if we did auditing right, if we did all IAAA right, and especially auditing, we can now uh, uh, point a finger at the individual and say, hey, you know what, you did this and that. And how do we know that? Because we have all the trace logs and we know uh, we went through everything right in the authentication. We know it's you, you ran your fingerprint and this and that. Uh, so we can get the non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is really important if we want to take legal actions against an individual. And it's important when you work in remote offices. So when you don't see the individual, when it's all logical, it's all bit, uh, 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 ones and zeros on systems. Uh, so you want to get as close as possible to non-repudiation in your answers when you are asked about uh, strong authentication, strong mechanisms for access. Again, bottom line of IAAA is accountability. We want to target a person. And remember, accountability cannot be something that the organization bears. It's, it's the individual, it's the, the person. We need a person behind the actions. <clears throat> Defense in depth or uh, layered security is another principle in security that we want to follow, and this is another uh, type of uh, 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 mechanism that uh, ISC wants us to uh, know before we take the CISSP exam. The idea behind defense in depth is that we say that no one control can be sufficient 
for maximum security. If we want to get maximum security, if we want to get as close as possible to 100% security, and there's no such thing as 100%, let's say we want to get to 99.99%, we cannot rely on just one control. <clears throat> we cannot just rely on one layer of control. So if our layer is prevention, we cannot do prevention, people, process, technology all the way and expect it to fully work 100% of the time. We need prevention, we need detection, we need correction, we need to respond, we need to recover, we need to investigate and predict and all this. And we also want to do things, not just on the technology side of things, but also people and processes. So we want to have policies in place and we want to have people trained. So this is defense in them. Um, no one technology will be sufficient for any type of question by IEC. And remember this. When you answer the questions uh, of ISC, of the CISSP, they want you to think large, big businessmen. Okay, so think defense in depth. Where do I miss the controls? If all controls are technological, look for another control that can be procedural, can be directive control, can be a policy that you wrote or adopt uh, a regulation here or there, or standard here or there. Uh, uh, people that you can get trained or educated or aware of uh, uh, security issues, those are the areas that you want to invest in. <clears throat> security management plans um, refers to basic business plans, if you may. So this is not uh, just about security, it's about how businesses are doing what they're doing. Businesses think from the top down. They think first, they think strategy, they think about the goals and the missions and the objectives, just like what we did with this bootcamp. When we started the bootcamp, I said that our objective, and you will hear this a lot from me during the bootcamp, our objective is to pass the exam. Now, if my objective, if our objective, this group is to pass the exam, the CISSP exam, then I ask the questions on how to accomplish this objective, how to accomplish this goal. And the, the way to accomplish it is to, to buy the book and to uh, participate in this bootcamp and to get uh, in a study group, maybe reach out to some of the people in this group and study together. So those are the details on how to accomplish the goal. But what is it that I need to do every day in order for me to accomplish the goal and to get to the objective that I want to? Those are the operational steps that I take. So operational steps will take me toward achieving my tactical goals and achieving my tactical goals will get me to achieving my strategic goals. OK, so it's this pyramid that uh, enables every business or any type of business to accomplish what they do. If businesses work only on the operational side, they kind of put put off fire, fires every day and they don't look at the grand, uh, uh, the grand plan or the, the road ahead of them, the, the year ahead of them, maybe the, the two years, five years ahead of them. Uh, so they miss their goals, they miss their, their, their purposes. Um, and and uh, for the CIS speed, the answer for what is the purpose of businesses is money. Um, so businesses would like to make money under the CISSP. I personally don't believe in that, but it's something that ISC would like us all to answer. Our purposes in businesses is to make money. It's an American CISSP, so let's bear that in mind. Um, and let's move forward to the next one. Next one, and I think this will be our last topic today. Uh, change management. Change management is important because we want to maintain security uh, um, in face of changes. So, so we need to manage our changes. We don't want anybody to come into the organization and just say, oh, you know what, instead of having uh, uh, Windows 2003 here on this server, I want to upgrade it to the uh, latest version, Windows uh, 2016. Uh, uh, or, or even the new version or, or newer version of 2003. 2003 is out of date, is, 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 is not patched anymore, so it's old. The change is required, but we don't want to just do it because if we just do it and it's not monitored, it's not managed, then it might and it will cause problems to the business and we want to avoid that. 
So for the change management, we have three main roles in the CISSP. We have the requester of the change, someone that actually puts the request for a change and there's a reason behind it. There's a business reason behind it. And then we have the change manager. The change manager is part of the change review board. So we have an individual that requests an individual that gets the requests and brings it in front of the board. This is the process ISC wants us to follow in the way to proper change management process. First, we have the change identification. So the requester identifies the need for a change. The need for a change is just identified in that area and therefore uh, triggers the request for a change. So the uh, requester puts the request for a change. And it's not just a request box, it's just, just a, a suggestion box in the organization. It's an actual change. This can be the VP for R&D that identified too many changes in the version of the software that we develop in our organization that we will need to go through another version uh, now. So the change request is put there in front of the change uh, uh, manager. The change manager reviews that request and can put it back to the change requester and say, hey, you missed a point here and there. Hey, you know what? I missed this uh, topic here and there. Maybe you can explain more. Maybe you can elaborate more. After the request is reviewed, it is brought in front of the change board. The change board then prioritizes all requests for change. And let's say our change request came out first. So this is priority number one for the organization. Now the change board evaluates the impact on the business. So it's not just important to say, oh, we will need, we will need to uh, create a new version of our software because there might be a business impact. So we want to talk to sales, we want to talk to marketing, we want to speak about this change with others outside the R&D group. And then the board either approve or reject the uh, request based on all this analysis. Now, look at this carefully. Up until this point, no change has been taking place yet. Nothing happened. So all we see in this first six steps are the request, the identification for a change, a lot of discussions, and nothing really happened. This is important to remember in your CISSP exam. Nothing happens before change testing. We don't move uh, a system, no, we don't move uh, the data, we don't change places. Nothing happened before change testing. Now, after the board approved the change, now the requester or the requester delegates need to ch test that change. So they go to a testing environment, they develop whatever code they want there, they test it, and then they go to implementation, they move to production. If something happened in production and it's not right, they go back to testing. So in this model, in this process, we can always go back one step. We cannot go from implementation back to the request because this is not the proper way to do things. It's not the proper way to manage your business. You go back to testing, you see what happened there. Maybe the approval was wrong, so we go back from testing to approval. Now, once implementation is conducted and, and successful or, or uh, declared successful by the group that actually went through the changes, then the review board uh, sits together and decides on the post-implementation uh, uh, conclusions. And this is important because we want to use this experience to learn more about how changes are made right in our organization. So the benefits of the change control, and we will uh, uh, com conclude this session with this slide now. The benefits, the five benefits of the change control are to prevent uh, unwanted security reduction or control uncontrolled changes. We don't want everybody, anybody to just make their own changes. Documentation and tracking uh, all the alteration of the, inform uh, uh, the information and environment is really important because documenting whatever you do helps you 
um, cover your behind. So you don't want to be exposed if you don't document things. If you don't document things, any audit can come in and look for the documentation. If you don't have those, that means that you didn't do things right. Um, you don't have documentation to support your actions. It's just like taking no actions. Standardizations, once we manage our changes and you saw the flow of all the process, that creates standardization. That means that we have a standard for how changes are being made. And also complying with our security policies. We want changes to comply with everything that we are obligated to and also requirement from the outside, from the external requirements. And then the ability to go back and uh, fix those if unwanted or unexpected outcomes uh, and this mostly speaks about applications and when we think we develop this wonderful application, we write a wonderful code, but unexpected outcomes come in. When we do proper change control, we can go back one step and we will speak about that in domain eight when we talk about application security. In our next session next week, um, again, Monday, unless changes are made and I will communicate via the email invite, via the uh, meeting invite. Um, in our next session, we will start from this slide uh, about data classification and about how we classify data uh, for commercial organizations and for government slash military organizations. Those are two different type of classifications because they're two different type of businesses. Yes, government and military are also businesses. Uh, however, they operate differently. So I'm really happy that we did this, guys, um, and um, that we got to have, uh, wow, I see, phew, I look at the participant list here and it's long, long, very long, and uh, I couldn't be more happy um, to uh, provide this platform for all of us to learn and uh, be more successful in our, um, in our, CISSP exam. So yes, um, I'll just answer a couple of questions that came on the chat room. Uh, there will be a recording uh, of this session and I will publish this recording and share it with the group uh, so you can listen it to it later on. And uh, yes, thank you Ami as well for participating uh, and Yossi, looking forward to having you next time. Everybody, thank you very much. Looking forward to having the next session with you. And again, um, we can uh, add sessions to those 10 sessions as we go, as we need them. Just reach out to me, WhatsApp, email, um, uh, Facebook, whatever you need, let me know. And I'll try to uh, share some supplementals as well uh, as we go. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. And looking forward to the next one. Bye-bye.